and uh, welcome to European News Weekly. Uh, we have uh, myself and Jimmy Hagen, uh, and I am Sean McGee. Uh, we both have uh, a guest in uh, today who's um, uh, we've uh, pulled in because uh, it's uh, in the light of the recent finds by Samantha Joy of uh, the University of Georgia uh, in Athens, uh, established that the uh, Corexit did not break up the oil um, and only sunk, it only sunk and it killed the uh, Mokra Bile community. Uh, uh, we introduced um, Scott Porter today uh, to talk about this, uh, and uh, he himself was forced to uh, dive by uh, the, the NOAA, and this was weeks past the notice that was sent to the EPA, the uh, Environmental Agency in the USA, uh, telling the NOAA, uh, the, uh, the, National, the National Oceans Authority, uh, to keep its uh, divers out of the water. Um, so, uh, I, I'm aware uh, that there is an amazingly uh, good amount of evidence, solid evidence, um, uh, that, that Scott was badly advised, so there's uh, been FOIs and all sorts of things, uh, that information is well stashed. Um, and um, just to sort of give an outline of what he did, he did his uh, graduate work in marine biology in California, and then moved to Louisiana to do uh, aquaculture work. Um, now, he's... Uh, for the last few years, he's been involved with eco rigs, and the organisation is unique in that they dive off abandoned platforms uh, in the Gulf uh, to harvest uh, coral uh, and the sort of the new coral growth that's going on there. Um, and uh, we'll get to talking about that with Scott. Um, his um, work is uh, finding out at the moment if there are high levels of crude and corrects that still in the water. Is uh, one aspect of what he um, and uh, he had some issues while he was uh, doing diving uh, during the actual disaster. Um, and in fact, uh, we were saying that they shouldn't be diving in the water at all. But uh, the oil actually uh, ruined two of his vulcanized rubber suits. Um, so, uh, and himself, he's been uh, quite injured uh, in uh, sort of a number of ways uh, by uh, sort of being around these sort of hydrocarbon and various other uh, volatile compounds uh, that uh, were floating around and we, we think are still floating around in the BP Gulf oil area. Um, so, uh, right, so obviously he will not eat anything coming out of the Gulf. Um, I think that's very common. Um, constant leaks uh, from uh, about orphaned and abandoned wells. Maybe we could ask him about that. And um, uh, it might be worth pointing out just before I introduce him that uh, maybe we could start off with this topic. Uh, that he actually devised a test for the uh, environmental impact of the uh, BP Gulf oil disaster. Um, and uh, he, did, he designed this for the NOAA. Uh, they, they tried to, uh, they thought about uh, sort of taking him up on this. And, uh, and then his, uh, his uh, research uh, idea was uh, basically declined. So um, anyway, Scott, if, if we start off with this, and I know you have so many other things that I haven't covered, but uh, um, certainly in, with this thing, it's quite, quite an interesting story. I mean, you were telling me last night, um, and you were saying about uh, the fact that they went with another study, and you told me an amazing figure that they were putting out there. Um, and um, I think your study would have probably been a lot cheaper had it been done on sort of uh, rigs as, as opposed to uh, in the deep sea. So, with that in mind, could you take us in? Uh, welcome, Scott, by the way, and um, uh, welcome to uh, European News Weekly. And I hope this will be the first of maybe one of two interviews uh, where we can expand on some of your stories. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I'd like to thank you for helping us to get out this, the information about what's still going on here, what we're still. <laughs> but what, what you're alluding to is the coral research that. Um, that we propose, we proposed first for NOAA back in 2010. And, um, obvious, it was obvious to us that by 2011 that they were not going to fund any of our, uh, proposals for any of the sampling that, that we, um, thought, you know, uh, should be done. And so I went ahead and carried out a smaller version of it. But even the smaller version, what I could afford at the time, and I was able to collect coral. Uh, watch them exude or, you know, really pollute my recirculating water tanks, uh, quarantine tanks. And um, so after about the third time of this happening in a row, I collected the, the exhum, whatever they were pushing out of themselves, purging out of them. And we were able to send this to a lab and have it confirm that it was Macondo oil. 
Um, we later, I guess, about, it took us about a year to get that paper published, which that was pretty quick in uh, technical documents time for a peer review journal. And um, I, I'd say a little over a year, maybe. And uh, we had to go, you know, went through several till we found one that was willing to publish it. But as it stands today, it's the only document of its kind talking about, you know, um, reef forming stony corals, what's called scleractinian corals. And the corals that we're talking about, uh, people, you know, don't believe us that we have coral below Louisiana, but we really do. We've got, um, you know, the platforms off of our coast that the oil and gas um, industry has installed for, you know, pulling out the hydrocarbons. Well, it also acts as a an oasis, really, for um, reforming organisms and then all the other symbiote um, communities that live around the reef. And really, you know, that, that's been our, our goal. We've been looking at those since the 90s, watching these reefs grow and studying them. And um, when the spill hit, we told Noah that, look, the platform acts like a vertical um, profiler of the water column. We can tell you what concentrations of what compounds came by this platform from the bottom all the way to the surface. And it, um, in the beginning, it sounded like they were interested. And when it turns out, the stuff that they were funding, which of course, it, it, all of the research typically today is funded by BP dollars. And because BP is paying for it, it gets to direct the um, trend of the investigation. You know, I mean, it's really insane to think that you're going to let the criminal control the investigation, but that's exactly what NOAA has done. And the EPA, our Environmental Protection Agency, they've just basically stepped back and said, oh, that's the oceans, that's NOAA's responsibility. And so, um, you know, during 2010, 2011, when the government's trying to find, you know, hydrocarbons in the Gulf and the, you know, profile of the water column, they're not finding a lot of positive samples. And they are, uh, they were reassured by that, that dispersant was working. And yet we were diving under the Gulf, videoing these dispersed oil clouds and, and then since then, over the next several years, I watched the reefs that used to be like Alice in Wonderland under the water. It, it's now turned into the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. I mean, it, I go and I, you know, swim in an area that's, it's, it's literally dead. I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the organisms that I would, or the corals that I would normally try to harvest were gone. They were completely dead, killed by contaminated marine snow. Um, just out of uh, interest, do, do you have any sort of uh, corroboration to those that, that those sort of uh, facts? You know, is there, what, what sort of evidence is there? Well, um, you know, video, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and a video is worth more more than the, the picture. So, literally, to get our um, point across, we had to take our uh, research video. I have a camera that I take under with underwater with me diving, just to kind of document the dive for myself. They're my, like my video notes. So I was able to, um, you know, take some of my video notes and clip some before and afterwards. And we're not, you know, and I'm not talking about 2004 type dives when we, you know, started looking in this area. 2003, 2004 is, you know, some of the first dives we were collecting coral near the river and near Macondo. Um, we're talking about recently, like uh, May 4th um, dive that we took Jeff Corwin out for CBS Evening News um, with Katie Kurt. We, um, we had that video and just the difference between that video and our uh, 2014, uh, 2013 video. It's amazing. It's, it's, looks like two totally different places. And we were talking about a place called, it's, the platform's called Lena, MC280A. And it's one of the most, it used to be one of the most beautiful installed structures in the world. It was, it was supposedly the largest installed structure in the Gulf of Mexico. And it had coral. It was completely covered from about 15 foot down, well past 60 and 80 feet, where, where is about the depth that I don't dive past, because I'm really trying to collect coral. So, and, you know, it's just not the same place. It, it was amazing, the contamination of marine snow, what it had, what, what it did to it. Now, that doesn't mean it killed everything. The strongest survive. And, of course, um, in 2013, I actually uh, videotaped a lionfish the size of a basketball on that platform. I've never seen lionfish on it before, but there they are. The Volton lionfish is right there on our platforms now. So, so.
I'm sorry. Uh, so that's basically uh, on the platforms, is it uh, that you're talking about? So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Whether they're whether they're um, a working platform or an abandoned platform, you know, they all act as uh, act as literally uh, an oasis in the desert. It, it's an amazing ecosystem underneath the water. There, you know, we took Jeff Corwin out, and he uh, he we pulled up to the platform. And he said, "That's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. That rusting iron structure right here in the middle of nowhere." And when he dove down and saw the life that was under there, he came up and was just amazed, blown away at the amount of life that this structure holds. So, and we're, we're, you know, and the the problem is that these these reefs are the first to be affected by oil and dispersed oil, and the worst to be affected by the dispersed oil. And when I say dispersed oil, when they dispersed it, you took it from the surface where it could be collected and broke it up into micro droplets that were then um, uh, that blow through the water column in different concentrations like cumulus clouds go blow through the sky. And of course, corals and other filter feeders on the reef, they're going to pick up those micro droplets of oil. And then it's um, once it's in the reef, it takes much, much longer to get out of the environment than it does if it was at the surface um, where it could be collected. So, and, you know, here it is five years later, um, and, you know, we bring up the, the uh, comment about our research paper to NOAA, because I still to this day um, bring it up to them and ask them for comments. And so uh, we, we really weren't getting any comments until, um, I guess, about a, a few months back, maybe six months ago, uh, NOAA and NERDA, N-R-D-A, National Resource uh, I can't remember the the rest of it, but it's the agency that's responsible for the testing and the analysis portion of the um, oil spill. Uh, they were touting how good that the Gulf looked and how um, it's bouncing back, and that you know they really weren't seeing any problems with the fish or anything you know offshore, and that you know they weren't seeing any problems with the corals. And then I hit them up with my uh, document and the videos. And started telling them that that's not what I'm seeing when I dive out there. And when was the last time that they dove out there? And when did they get underwater and look, you know, at the reef itself? And had they ever? And that was the only time we started getting attention from NOAA. And what they did was they contacted our, the head of our nonprofit, Steve Colian, who's also listed on the document. He helped me write it. Uh, they contacted him in discussions about the fingerprinting of the oil. They weren't really concerned that we found oil in the corals. They were really concerned about the fingerprinting and making sure that we, that our fingerprint was uh, accurate. And so um, the way he claimed it to us is that he wanted to make sure he understood um, the science behind what we were doing. So because he was going to argue it to, to the Deepwater Rise inv investigation to the attorneys. And so um, where that went, I haven't heard anything about it for probably three or four months now. And uh, last I know, it was a conversation between several biochemists, Steve Colian and the NOAA representative trying to um, determine how accurate the fingerprint was. So, but they still haven't gone out and replicated the, the work. You know, it took, it cost me maybe $10,000 to do it. And the government, um, you know, it. You know, they could easily spend a million dollars doing it. Sure. So, so I mean, the bottom line is obviously they could t take a lot of different uh, points as well. They could try a, a wider sort of uh, uh, studies, which would obviously be uh, more statistically significant. I believe. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and let's look at why they're not finding. If somebody's not finding stuff that you expect to be there, and then other independent researchers are finding it, then you have to examine your standard operating procedures. And NOAA, we were able to prove with another peer-reviewed document that we put out, which is called Distributions of the Hydrocarbons in the Gulf of Mexico from the Department uh, from the Deepwater Horizon. Um, we were able to prove that that we found it. They didn't. Noah didn't. And the reason that Noah didn't find it is perhaps they were using the, is is the equipment they were using and the the stand, the protocols that they were using. In other words, they were using um, plastic or plexiglass sampling containers and which were lipophilic. They are attracted to the oil. So any oil that's captured in that sample has a uh, uh, a likelihood of being stuck to the side of the container before it gets into your 
you know, your, your, your sample holding, your final holding container. So re reduce the hydrocarbon count. Then. That's right. Right. So if you're not targeting it, and, and their complaint to us was, well, you're, you're not random sampling. You're targeting the samples, and, and that's where you got to start. You know, as an industry biologist, I used to perform bioassays. And when we went and took our samples for our bioassays, we had to target the places that were potentially a contamination. Or um, if we had a wastewater, we couldn't just go take water from the drinking fountain and claim that as a sample. No, we had to sample the wastewater. Well, none of that was required, it, it looks like, in, by NOAA this time. I mean, they just let BP do what they wanted to and continue to do this day. You know, GOMRI, G-O-M-R-I, Gulf Mexico Research Institute, which is funded by BP, just recently released its um, latest round of research is $38 million and it's basically a couple of handfuls of, pro of projects that I only saw two that were um, uh, even, you know, remotely interesting that could give us an idea of what's going on out there. Um, the worst, the most egregious one was they were going to investigate how resilient the people are. <laughs> and I mean, people down here, there are people complaining about, you know, potential problems from the oil spill. And they're going to study how resilient people are. Instead of doing the medical analysis on the folks, they won't even run the blood test to determine if people have higher concentrations of um, hydrocarbons in their bloodstream than the rest, rest of the nation. I mean, they won't even do something as simple as that. So, I mean, in terms of pollution uh, sort of pathways, uh, we'll be saying, we're well, obviously mentioning food as being a one pollution pathway. Um, and then basically you get this, um, what's it, sea to uh, land transfer, which happens when uh, you have storms or uh, just the normal uh, action of waves crashing on the, the beach. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so basically <clears throat> you're, you're saying basically, that, I mean, obviously there's the, the health effects, the, these hydrocarbons, they could be measured quite easily, could they? Uh, yes. People? Uh, yes. And uh, do you know of any studies uh, that's been done? I think you were actually saying that there was uh, a, a, that there was no, even though the Gulf is a, a, an oil-rich place, uh, you know, it's, they've been doing uh, the the uh, sort of uh, uh, industry there for, for for many decades that they didn't have any uh, sort of format uh, when when this happened, this disaster happened, uh, to even check for people's uh, sort of hydrocarbons in their blood. Could could you take us to that uh, point? That sort sure. Of? Sure, just to give you a little background, um, offshore oil drilling began below Morgan City, Louisiana, which is just just west of us, uh, below the Atchafalaya River in 1947, I believe it was, in like 18 feet of water. And then it's progressed to uh, be just before the oil, or I'm sorry, just before Katrina, there were over 4,000, probably like 43, 4,400 installed structures in the Gulf of Mexico which, by the way, created the world's largest chain of artificial coral reef um, that that we could even possibly conceive of. I mean, it just dwarfs anything else in the world that's ever been installed. And so, um, yeah, in South Louisiana, they just, in the beginning of the oil drilling, they just kind of, you know, it was rough and, and hard on the environment down here. And the drilling in Port Sulphur, what they used to do in the 70s, is they would dig a pit and um, put all of their wastewater in the pit, didn't even have to be lined. They just put their wastewater in the pit, and when they finished drilling, they left, and the pit was still there. A storm would come up and knock the levees down on the pit and distribute the hydrocarbons throughout the, um, you know, throughout the uh, estuary there. And so, I mean, it to this, you know, I mean, oil is just, the oil industry has, has really uh, gotten away with, you know, uh, too much. I mean, I hate to say it. I'm a consultant for oil companies too, but you know, as an environmental consultant, they, um, you know, there are some good companies that try to be good stewards, but unfortunately, the majors are they just, you know, they they talk a good game, but but they're really not. Their hearts not, you know, they're well, one of the big blockers of our research for sure. I, I agree, and and I have to say, uh, at the end of the day, they they're basically uh, when they have an accident, that's when the, the 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 gloves come off for them. You know, they're they're uh, they just take over the whole local community. Yeah, yeah I'm glad. That's right. I'm glad you brought that up because that's really where I'd like to go with this. Is you know, um, after the Exxon Valdez spill, we were supposed to have these huge standards that were going to protect us from this, and set up these this um, uh, corporation called Marine Spill Response Corporation. 
MSRC that was going to um, be funded by the major companies were going to donate to this this uh, organization and they were going to purchase skimming boats and oil spill response boats and um, be ready on all these coastal areas starting with the supposedly starting with the Gulf Coast since we produce most of the oil in the country we've got the offshore oil drilling let's just face it I mean 90 percent of it's done here <laughs> offshore anyway and so um all of this was supposed to be set up but then that got that company got pushed to the side by another private company who came in another spill response company and um and they just basically squandered the money didn't have any boats ready when the spill hit and then when it hit they said oh my gosh we don't know what to do let's just spray it with dispersants Let's disperse it. And so, um, you know, and by the way, why is all of this a national secret, a Defense Department secret? How much uh, core exit they put in the water, where they put it, and um, what's the dilution factor that they think it get it takes to get us back to safe levels? All of this we should have known after the Exxon Valdez. You know, the research was out there. They were supposed to continue it and supposed to do ongoing research on every oil that they collected. Um, they were supposed to do a bioassay on it and tell us what, you know, how dangerous it was supposed to be and what you had to do to clean it up. None of this was done. And so when Deepwater Horizon hit, you know, everybody literally threw their hands up in the air and said, well, I don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. Everyone at NOAA, that is. But us in the industry, we started telling, we started we coming up with a plan right away. You know, we got the engineers together that would do something about the wellhead. We got the spill response folks together to try to start skimming, you know, and, and if they're going to use dispersants, we understand the use of dispersants, or we did, on a minimum scale. They were only supposed to use dispersants when it wasn't conducive, the weather wasn't conducive to skimming. And then they just took it and used it as a wide scale um, relief from the surface, the water surface. And they tried to use the idea that it was marine birds, the reason that they used it. The oil company's excuse, Exxon, uh, in the Exxon Mobil dispersant usage guidelines, they say it's that birds only lay two eggs at the time, fish lay millions of eggs. So it's better to kill some fish than it is to kill the birds. Really what it is, is they don't want to see the oil on the surface. So. And t talking about, as we're, where we have this theme going, uh, you did mention also uh, about the NOAA uh, not having any kind of testing procedure for uh, testing uh, crab contamination. Uh, and exactly. The seafood, they don't even know, you know, when we started talking about the seafood and the water and the reef samples that we were able to collect in the beginning, they just wanted water samples. And... We were saying, well, we've got reef, we've got seafood, you know, we can sample the livers of fish. We can, you know, what do you, we can pull all of these samples while we're out there. And nope, they only wanted to look at water samples. And um, they said they didn't know how to look at the others just yet. And we were beside ourselves that this is the federal government and they're going to claim that they don't know the protocol for an analyzing oil in the seafood. And by the way, you know what their protocol ended up being? The sniff test. They were trying to sniff seafood, saying that, oh, we are trained to smell hydrocarbons. Well, let me tell you this. When I worked for the laboratory in the 80s, um, most of the organic compounds that I had to deal with, you could, you know, if you could smell them, then they were above, you know, uh, 20 parts or 30 parts per million. You could only smell it in the, when it got down to 30, 50 parts per million range, typically, is what you were smelling. And, um, and so we know these things are dangerous down to 1, 10, and 20 parts per million. As a matter of fact, they say that core exit is, um, has an LC50 number of 10 parts per million, a lethal concentration 50 of 10 parts per million. And if you can only smell it above 30 parts per million, then how are you going to detect it at a dangerous level? I mean, it's, it's just absurd that they're going to try to smell for this. So when we started bringing this, the idea up and bringing the idea of bioassay of these compounds and depuration of the organisms to see what's coming out of it so we can analyze what they purge, it really fell on deaf ears. And here it is five years later, and the reports that they're producing now and trying to claim them as science, it's it's literally looks like, to me, it's like Mickey Mouse going working at Disney World. Um, and what I mean is when you do a bioassay, typically for an industry trying to dump wastewater, 
you have to do an acute bioassay and follow it up with a chronic bioassay so that you can determine the level of least noticeable effect. And then whatever number that is, and it's usually 20 parts per billion, maybe 10 parts per billion for a lot of these organic compounds, um, most of the time then it, it's in that range, 20 parts per billion. You have to dilute it back down below usually 10 parts per billion for it to be safe and before you can re release it into any other sewage or natural body of water. That's typical requirements of industry. None of that was done this time. The NOAA act played dumb, didn't require that type of analysis, and the analysis that they did produce recently under the government funding is they did the acute version talking about the LC50 numbers, lethal concentration 50 and acted ignorant of the capabilities of the chronic seven-day analysis. Now, together, the acute analysis is four days. The chronic analysis is another seven days. So it's routine in the laboratories here in Louisiana. Back in the 80s, I mean, we had, back in the 80s, both of these um, techniques were required in Louisiana. And here it is, 2010. 2010, and they weren't requiring the chronic portion of it. As a matter of fact, they were using standards, lesser standards in the Gulf of Mexico that they had adopted from California. I know because I also worked in a laboratory in California where we did bioassays, and the chronic was not required in California, only the acute analysis. And I was kind of shocked. I would have thought California would have been well beyond Louisiana, but nope, Louisiana was ahead of its time as far as analysis. And somewhere in there between 1990 and 2010, something went wrong. And, um, I, you know, personally, I blame the Mineral Management Service. Even though, by the, even though the Mineral Management Service did give me uh, or give my research team a, a large grant to study the coral, um, you know, I still do blame the Mineral Management Service for what was going on because they were working way too closely with the industry officials that they were, oh, I'm sorry, the industry employees that they were supposed to look over, watch over. And um, by the way, the mineral management system was uh, just, you know, broken up and reformed into what's called the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, could, could we come back to the uh, point about the uh, the corals and the deep sea study that NOIA took on? Because initially they they obviously said no to your your study. So, what what was the deal? How much was the the cost of the the, the study they've done for deep sea coral? And uh, saying a few things about that. Well, you know that's a good question. How much they spent on it? Because that's what we've been wondering is um, when we first proposed the coral research, we were explaining how. The um, corals on the platform are, you know, excellent at picking up whatever's coming by. And we can also tell which ones are hurting by studying them. And instead of funding the research on the easily accessible corals on the platforms that you could easily dive on, they funded the uh, deep sea coral search, which is like looking for a needle in a haystack. There are very, very few of these colonies down there. They are not skeleton forming colonies. They're soft corals. And and they are um, trying to find one with an ROV is literally like, you know, I mean, it's pitch black down there and you've got the lights on your ROV, which is like a small flashlight. So you got to get lucky to come across them. And um, and so instead of studying the sclerotinian, the reforming corals, they try to go find the hardest ones that they can find. In other words, they pass the platforms up with the easy corals so that they can go offshore and spend 10 times as much putting an ROV overboard than it does a diver. And um, even if he's in hazmat suit, it doesn't cost as much as ROV uh, operations at 5,000 feet. And so... You know, we were kind of, we sat kind of beside ourselves when we saw them, you know, you, matter of fact, you know what they were doing? They used my, they used a picture of me diving um, and holding my corals up for the Associated Press. Um, when I took them out diving, they used those pictures for the cover of their story about the deep sea corals. If that's not ridiculous. And so, I mean, it, this is the kind of ludicrous stuff that they do. It, it, they're like clowns. And then when I just saw the G Gomery, uh, G Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative or Institute, or whatever. Um, they just got an, they just put in their budget another big portion of it, probably several million dollars, to go back and try to find those deep sea corals. They passing right by the the platforms. Now, I mean, we did. You know, it's not like they didn't hear us. 
you know, they heard us and then they funded somebody else, anyone else that would put in a proposal similar. And what I mean by that is there is a Dr. Carol, Karis Mitchell-Mort. Um, I believe she's at the University of Massachusetts. I'll have to look it up. It may be North Carolina, but I, I'll have to look it up to make sure. But this woman mined us for information, me specifically, email after email, phone call after phone call, hours um, of work that we put in personal communication with her so that she could get a grant. I characterized the reefs that were in this area, showed her what kind of coral she could, you know, harvest to, to find the uh, hydrocarbons and these are the ways to best look at it. And you have to fingerprint it to prove what you're finding. And so she ended up getting her grant, even though, and she didn't, you know, once she got her grant, by the way, it was on her last day. She begged us, to, like, I have to have this information by today or I can't get my grant. Would you please, please do this for me? And when we did, as soon as she got the grant, she didn't hire us. She didn't hire my company to go to help her collect those, you know, corals or to do the study. She just totally ignored us. Now, this is two years after our, my coral paper has come out. She finally gets her, uh, starts to publish her materials last year. And, um, and you know, she didn't acknowledge any of our work. No thank you for the background that we gave her. Not even a notation of our coral paper in the publication, which she, you know, she basically, I don't want to say plagiarized, but she, um, she, she stole it off anyway. That's right. And so, you know, and it was something that people didn't even believe it until I, I had to pull the emails, print them, and put them on my Facebook page and other places for people to say, oh, my gosh, she really did take the head. She really did to just show what the government has been as allowed to happen. They don't want to know the truth. They want a half-assed version. Pardon my French. Um, I, I am a I am in South Louisiana, by the way, so. Yeah, but we're in Ireland. We, uh, a lot more swearing goes on over here. Right. <laughs> so, and, and so the corals, the point that I'm trying to make with the corals is, um, these corals, if they're still contaminated, which our last collections, 2013, 2014, showed that they were still purging oil into our systems and, and polluting them. Um, they're going to recontaminate whatever water is coming past them or, or whatever fish are living around off eating the bugs that live on the, the reef. I mean, it's, you know, it's not going away, and they don't want to hear about it. Sure, and and uh, I mean, obviously, when when it comes to the sort of the the, the giant eel, uh, the Ophictus rex, um, could you give us some sort of feedback on on on, on that? You know, it's kind of a world famous uh, beastie, and uh, I would say that, uh, that that you know that everybody in the Gulf is aware of it, and. Um, it, would you just give us a bit of a gen up on, on, on what happened there, what studies are, are being done or not being done? Indeed. You know, that's a, that's a perfect question for this for the time that we're talking about. You know, uh, the areas that they're looking for the deep sea coral, the, the benthos, you know, 5,000 feet down, is the home to what's called the giant eel. And... Um, and it's a used to be a, a pretty good sized fishery, you know. And um, if you wanted to see what was happening in the sediments down there, you go and you collect the largest predator that you can find there. That and the Ophictus rex is the largest predator down there. He lives in the sediments, in and out of the mud, and, and across the top of the mud. And uh, you know, this is the area that the hydrocarbons are going to settle. You know, uh, the marine snow brings the hydrocarbons to the bottom. And they get locked up in the sediments until animals like this eel swims through it. And uh, the eel doesn't have scales. It has a skin. And because of that, it um, it can't protect itself as well from hydrocarbons. Actually, um, hydrocarbon uptake in the body uh, cutaneously through the skin is the most um, efficient way to get contaminations into the body. So the, the giant eel, if you were going to, you know, it, it's a it's an indicator species. Likewise, what about the Atlantic eel? You ought to be able to study the gigantic eel in the Gulf and determine what are its background um, levels of hydrocarbons. And then you, you know, check the Atlantic eel and see what it looks like. Yeah, I might, I might point out to our viewers that the Atlantic eel uh, in 2013, uh, and it's not the first time this has happened, 2013, it went back on the extinct, extinction risk registers in uh, on uh, uh, according to European reports. So, so sorry, uh, carry on, uh, Scott. No, no, that and and that's why it's 
that, and that's exactly why we bring it up. You know, there's talking about endangered species. If it's already on that teetering point, and you add hydrocarbons, which we, you know, we know that hydrocarbons affect the reproduction rates and viability of young. That's one of the things that we study is the formation of the vertebrate, of uh, you know, vertebrate spine um, in larval fish when we're trying to bioassay to determine how dangerous compounds are. So, um, yeah, if it's already on the brink, you know, of extinction, something like this, it doesn't take much to just push it over the edge. And it's not something you would notice. There's nobody out there on the bottom looking at these eels and, and really studying their populations. All of a sudden, they'll just be gone. And you were saying earlier that the, the, um, uh, the eels, that, you know, instead of having to get a submersible to look at the coral, uh, they've just got to throw a large line down. Um, and then uh, reel them up, and apparently they're really vicious. Uh, but uh, oh yeah, the uh, it's it's an amazing fishery. What you do is you put a long line out, and with your regular hooks, you put that long line overboard, and then when you, you let it set a few hours, as you're reeling it in, you have to have a guy stand out on the back deck because when the uh, if when the eels caught it comes on board, these things are vicious. They'll stand up several feet you know, three, four, five feet at you and, you know, sometimes head level and try to start biting at you. So a guy has to stand there with a bat and really it's battle. You know, the fish hit the deck and you smash it in the head to, to try to get it before it bites you. So, hey, the fish actually has a fighting chance with this one. It's pretty cool. Right. So, I mean, I mean, but the major point is obviously that to study the effects, that's what needs to be done. Then the body needs to be autopsy, checked for hydrocarbons, damage, genetic damage, whatever the, the issues are uh, exactly. that might be. And, exactly. uh, and it's not being done. And that would, how much would that cost, you know, if you were to do that uh, in, say, uh, 100 spots around the Gulf? How much would it cost? <laughs> that would, it would be so much more cost effective than putting one ROV study down. And, you know, you might ask, well, how do you know how much ROVs cost? Well, our uh, research that, that the MMS funded, it was to put a, an ROV all the way to the bottom on 10 different platforms. And so, um, you know, that and the collections and the study and the rental of the boat was $300,000 is what they gave us to do it. And that's with the 50% overhead that LSU charges, 50% overhead. They took 50% of our budget away. So and the university the basically just, just, just took half the money away yeah. before you got it, basically. It's that's right. part of their stipend, I suppose. That's it. Yeah. So 300000 turned into 150000 and we were still able to look you know, 10 platforms up and down real good. And you could easily do an eel study across there for in the na same neighborhood, same price range. Right, right, okay. Easy, very, very easy, probably that, less that, than that. That would be including lab costs as well. That it? would be, yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> including the lab costs. Right. Which is the most, it, what it, that's double. You know, whatever it costs me to go collect the samples, it's going to cost that or double um, to get them analyzed. Well, if I think there's any points to be made on what we've said so far, it's that, you know, I, I, I've told people that I've obviously been involved with the nuclear industry, uh, uh, sort of, it, and they're sort of shenanigans in, uh, in, in sort of, uh, should we say, studies. And, uh, but, but I have to say, BP has actually surpassed them. Uh, uh, the, the nuclear industry now seems like lightweights compared to what BP are putting in terms of the complete uh, sort of control of information. It's, it's quite amazing that that would actually happen in America. Um, well, yep, and you know, just uh, there are other ongoing leaks that are out there that we don't hear about. <laughs> and so it, it's, it, 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 somebody may say, oh, it's just that one company. Are you kidding me? No, it's, you know, this, we've got, we've got some issues out here. There's one called Taylor Energy that's been leaking since 2004 before Katrina or right at Katrina. And so, and recently it just came, you know, the Tulane was set, uh, suing them uh, for the Clean Water Act because they weren't even trying to fix it. They're just sitting on the money. They got a $4 billion fund and the attorneys are just sitting on the money. And so um, we were uh, bringing a lawsuit against them. And this is just to tell you what, what happens down here. Um, they, uh, the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic, they had grounds that, yes, it is still leaking and, you know, we'd like to do something about it, but no one had um, any grounds where they were hurt by it. 
And since I was an, a member of one of the environmental action, uh, the, it's called Lean, Louisiana Environmental Action uh, Network. Um, since I was a member of them and diving out there into this area, I was harmed by it because I can't continue my research um, in that area because Taylor Well is still leaking. And um, by the way, I did collect uh, Taylor Well oil back in 2012. And so, you know, uh, that's why it looked like uh, to us that the, the um, judge was going to allow the hearing to continue based on uh, that I was affected by it. And so this lawsuit was going to be the first one of its kind to come to to be to a hearing. And it was going to happen at October 5th, 2015. And do you know, a week or so before that date, Tulane Energy settled the case out of court for pennies. They, they gave $300,000 donation to LumCon. I mean, it was pennies. And it was because, and the point is that Tulane, even though they had the grounds, they didn't believe in winning. They didn't believe they could win it. So they settled for whatever they could get. But and when they settled, do they uh, apply a gagging order though, as well? Well, actually, um, this case is unique because that's the one thing they fought for, that all of their background data, all of the research that they did building up to this point would be public knowledge. It would be released to the public. Nice. And so uh, we, it's supposed to be released. Now, I haven't heard anything about it since then. None of the local news agencies told any of this. It would, would um, explain how this oil well is still leaking right off the coast, three or four miles from the coast. And, you know, it's covered with, oil, covered with silt, and they're not even planning on trying to go out there and plug it. And the local news, everybody just, they they don't want to hear it. They do not want to tell it. And the media is complicit in it. You want to know why, what's the dumbing down of the United States of America? It's the media. The media are not doing their job to inform the public of what's really going on. No longer the fifth estate. I think uh, the, the fifth estate is the alternative um, news scene, really, unfortunately. You know, talking about them, if, if you don't mind me bringing up the press and the media and what they do. Oh, please do, yeah. yeah. You know, I was, I was really, you know, I've always respected the Associated Press and thought that they were just a pure news origin, a, you know, news agency. But after the work with the spill, the all spill, where we, I took them out twice, took them diving and filmed for them, and I allowed them to use my video, and they totally ignored the truth in front of their eyes. Um, we showed them what was uh, happening and they didn't want to they didn't want to even address it and what I mean is um, when I took them back out in April of 2011 dove, we dove on a platform that I've dove many times before and while we were down there I, were, I was not seeing a lot of the more sensitive fish and invertebrate um, snails and coral uh, corillomorphs and stuff like that that I was seeing before some of the more sensitive ones were just not there and um, I took the same guy, Rich Matthews, that we'd taken out in, in uh, 2010. We took him back again. And I had a colleague of ours that he invited to come along. His name was Quentin Dokin. And um, Quentin Dokin's a friend of ours. And we had interviewed Quentin. I'm sorry? I think that was just in that code. Okay. And so we interviewed Quentin Dokin in January of 2010 for our own documentary. Well, when the Associated Press brought him out with us in April, I thought, well, great, that's going to be good. You know, we'll get his take on it and what he sees. And after we dove and saw the sporadic uh, dispersed oil clouds still passing through, not as heavy as it was in 2010, but they were still there and still passing through and still noticeable. And then, of course, um, some of the organisms, you know, that weren't there. And I started getting queasy on the dive myself. And so um, in the follow-up interview, after we dove it, I explained what I saw, which is I didn't see the um, chromises or some of the wrasses or the uh, corillomorphs or some of the snails that I was looking for. And that um, the dispersed oil clouds were thinner, but they were still there. I could still notice them coming through. And then he entered, they interviewed um, Quentin Dokin right afterwards, and he said, oh, everything looked fine to me. It looks like it's bouncing back. looks pretty good. And so um, I was appalled by this. You know, what in the world? What is he comparing this to? And so in front of Rich Matthews, I confronted him about it. I said, Quentin, when, you know, when did you dive? How many times did you dive in 2010? He said, I dove three times in 2010. I said, in the Gulf of Mexico? And he said, oh, no, in the Caribbean. I didn't dive at all in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. I was like, oh, okay. Well, when's the last time you dove 
over here in the main pass blocker rigs that you, you could compare this to. And he said, oh, I've never dove over here. This is a new spot for me. And I said, but you're going to claim that it looks good to you, that, you know, you don't know what was here before, and you're going to claim it looks good to you. And I'm sitting there telling you that these organisms were there. And did you see any of them? And he said, no, I, I, I didn't really see any of those. But it looked good to me. And so that was his testimony, and that's what the Associated Press used as their report, is, yep, everything looks good, everything looks fine. And I'll stunning. tell you something else. I'm sorry? I was just saying that was stunning. Yep, and one more thing, the um, the press, the ones that we did take out, like I said, Jeff Corwin's for Katie Kirk, CBS Evening News, uh, Associated Press, we took out Discovery Channel, Canada with Zaya, we took out CNN, we took out ABC, um, which got the local Fox News, every single one of these guys says, yes, and these scientists are going to have this um, analyzed in the laboratory, and we'll get back you, back to you with the findings. Every single one of them, want, you know, you use that. And then never wanted to hear the findings. When we tried to explain to them what we were seeing now, no, they, they would give a little fluff story and edit out all of the facts and details that we would give in the interviews and then just use a few words from us and then put everything in their words. And they always get it wrong. You know what, you know what the news media remind me of? If you ever see a car wreck and you hear three or four different people's version of what happened, that's about what the media sound like. They saw it and cannot get the story straight for, for hardly anything. So I, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about small media because Charles Diggs and several of the others have done a very, very good job on getting it out. But the TV's news media uh the video media scene you know cnn even didn't didn't do the follow-up properly so that's why anyway yeah i mean uh, my, my, my last little point here i've got uh, before i'm going to hand you over to jimmy jimmy you know i'm sure he's sitting there with his jaw open just to listen <laughs> to this uh but but um now obviously you mentioned charles williams Diggs there and i have to say you know he's he definitely has put me on he gave me a lot of info to do with this as well this particular uh, interview as well uh, and I want to give him a big heads up and a thank you uh, for his uh, help and support in in doing this. Um, and um, yeah, so but he did tell me. I mean, I did mention it at the start there about the uh, vulcanized rubber suits, uh, and you were saying he was saying that uh, they melted or something. What happened with those? Uh, do you want me asking? Yeah, I um actually one Vulcan one. Uh... My dry suit has vulcanized seals, rubber seals, around the wrists and around the neck, and the socks are vulcanized rubber. And my other wetsuit is a neoprene rubber. And um, actually, we'll start with my wetsuit because that's the first thing I was diving in. And it's a blend, a titanium blend. And so my um, uh, the um, neoprene portion of it started to get soft at the seams and basically what was trying to you know rip up as I was putting it on um, luckily it was a it's a high dollar one and it didn't just come to shreds and then another neoprene wetsuit that Rich Matthews dove in and got red oil all over it and by the way he said he was gonna pay for the gear that he ruined but they never did Associated Press didn't pay for anything didn't pay for the <laughs> didn't pay for the trip we took them out or anything it was ridiculous but um even so uh getting back to the dry suit so after a couple of times driving in the wetsuit then i started realizing that the, you know what we're seeing is not you know normal and, and it may not be you know good to drive in it with a wetsuit so i started diving in a dry suit and by the end of the summer my neck seal had um, started getting soft spots in it and the wrist seals i noticed because i usually have real thick thick um, vulcanized rubber seals so they're heavy duty i just started noticing soft spots like when i start to pull them off i'd notice it getting thinner and of course it it did eventually um rip before the end of the year tear a little bit and um in the meantime i put it to the side to and bought another got another dry suit and um, the one I put to the side, the collars, all the vulcanized rubber parts of it just seemed to melt. And it was just like it was left in the hot sun or or you, you literally set it next to the fire or something. It just started, you know, getting soft and melting to itself. And um, now the tri it was a trilaminate suit. In other words, the suit itself is, is resistant to... Um, to what I um, I want to say thinners, but uh, um, PAHs. 
aromatic hydrocarbons. It, it's resistant to the solvents. That's what I'm, yeah, solvents, you're right. So, um, so the suit itself, where the, you know, the, the trilaminate portion, that was still good, but all of my rubbers, uh, were ate away. And then some of the tape on the seams looked like it was going to be a problem. So, you know, it's not like I could just fix my suit and repair it and continue to go on and feel like nothing was going to happen. So that's why I bought the new suit. By the way, after diving in that new suit, um, I guess about a year and a half of diving on the oyster beds, collecting samples where these oyster beds were definitely oiled. Um, then my, my, uh, zippers started to leak and the seals on the zippers just, uh, didn't hold up. So, um, since That's then, uh, interesting. So, so one of the, the byproducts of this, this, uh, this oil spill is kind of this, a chemical, if you like, that eats rubber or melts rubber or damages various types of plastics or rubber. Right. And, you know, it, it's part of the, um, the dispersants or solvents. I mean, that's what they're using. They're going to use a dissolvent, uh, you know, and they're going to try to get as much active, uh, solving, solvent agents onto the oil as possible. So, um, you know, core exit is a designer molecule. And that's what we're trying to learn now is, okay, well, what's happened? What does this molecule look like once it starts to degrade some? What can we find? Uh, you know, is the glycol still there? And that's what I presume like. if it has been happening to two suits over a period of two and a half to three years, that, that one might presume that the Corexit in some form or other is still in those areas in some uh, level or other. Uh, maybe uh, low levels, but it's obviously enough to uh, to uh, cause you problems with your suit. Yeah, you know, now you're getting into a uh, a really sensitive subject for us right now because it's a discussion that we've been having, um, a disagreement that we've been having. Not really, I shouldn't say disagreement. It's been hard for me to believe that they were still spraying because we're not seeing red oil at the surface, so there's no need for them to spray. However, I, we I have still been seeing anomalous stuff at the surface into 2012 dispersed patches on the surface and they looked like they were dispersed they smelled just like fresh PAHs and they'll appear one day and then supposedly there's somebody here planes coming and but we don't know because nobody will tell us where they're spraying it so um, for the last couple of years though it's been pretty quiet and it's been hard for me to, to believe that they would still be applying core exit to the Gulf of Mexico However, when I take my UV light, the UV light out and I shine it on, um, a, you know, the fresh beach scene in Fushaw and Grand Isle and looking at, you know, examining the stuff that's on the beach, I'm seeing a green and light blue fluorescence that indicates um, the same stuff we were seeing on fresh tar patties in 2010 and fresh oil, fresh jars of red oil where we have a standard under the UV light, we know what it looks like. I'm still seeing those same colors showing up on the beaches. And um, and even do, on... Do you, see, do you see those on the fish as well? Uh, do you no, see I see it on the oysters. On the, on the outside edges of the oyster shell, one that's really baffling me right now is a light green fluorescence on the shell itself along with a, a pale reddish orange tint that also looks just like the color on the uh, tar balls that the oysters are. And when I shine that UV light on it, it, it glows green just like the antifreeze uh, sample. <laughs> so that's why we don't know. And that's the main question is, okay, what is it? What are we supposed to be, you know, able to see? What does it look like? And the government is just, I mean, it's a sleep at the wheel. Literally, they should be doing this. I, I hope you don't mind, but when I post this up on the WordPress, I'm going to probably have a picture of somebody with their heads in the sand. Um, yep. It's, it really does uh, suit so this thing. Um, man, I, I would really like to tell you about someone with their head in the sand. Okay. In, in 2014, we had um, the hurricane came through. And the day after, well, I'm sorry, the very next week after the hurricane came through and hit Grand Isle and Fouchon, um, we went down to the beach down there because we were hearing that there were large tar patties forming on the beach that they found on the beach. And we went down there with a scientific collection permit um, for some other stuff that we have and looking for these tar balls. And at first I was baffled because I saw all the runoff on the beach and the beaches looked, the whole island down there at Fouchon and Grand Isle looked terrible. I mean, it was the, the, um, the hurricane had stacked all of this oil. It, um, it, imagine if you took some oil and some flour and you made a big old thing of dough, right? Like you're going to bake in the oven. 
Well, imagine that on several miles long, stacked up on the beach that was three feet high. And that's what the tar mat looked like. It was just stacked up on the beach from Kaminata Pass to Bell Pass. We documented it on Sunday. The department, the EQ came down on Monday and closed the beach. And you know what? They, how they closed the beach? They said nobody can get on the beach or fish from the beach. They can go by a boat and pull up to the thing and fish, but you can't fish off the beach. And this, the mat that that um, hurricane pulled up and stuck on this beach, it, it was just, it, it was horrendous. So um, someone trying to stick their head in that sand, that, you know, I, that's what I'd like for them to do. Okay, well, uh, I'll tell you what, J Jimmy, Jimmy, it's been absolutely amazing download of information. And uh, yeah, is there, is there any way you want to take this or is there any impressions you have? Or, or I'll just leave you to it, man. You must have something. Yeah, well, I just wanted to pull, pull you back to the very beginning of the show, Scott, about uh, you mentioned marine snow. Is that, um, is that a natural uh, effect or is that something that would be caused by pollution? Um, no, actually, I, I thank you for bringing us back full circle because that's, you know, that's the way I like the discussions to go is come back to what we may have missed. And marine snow is a, um, it's a, bio a biological phenomena in the oceans. And what happens is, uh, as organisms live and they die, well, their bodies start to fall to the bottom. Or if there's detritus in the water, like from a large river that pumps the sediment into the water, there'll be what's called suspended solids in the water column that will eventually settle down. And all of that stuff that settles down is called marine snow. Interesting. So that's some, that's what we probably see when we look at divers going. We, I know when I watch sort of video underneath, what you see loads of little white. It's, it's almost like dusty, like, but it's a. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, okay, that's yep. good. Now, and and what happens? I take it the eels live live on that stuff as well, do they? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, no eel. I'm I'm not sure. I mean. They, anything that's on the bottom that's a filter feeder or in the water column, such as whale sharks that are filtering, they're either eating plankton and marine snow or, you know, I mean, the alive or dead. Usually if it's dead and it starts to fall, fall, they call it the marine snow. And so what happened was when you, you put 200 million gallons of oil and then you disperse it into micro droplets, well, then all that marine snow becomes a, a sponge for micro droplets of oil that are in the proximity to it. And so, and when I say a micro droplet of oil, um, they're not so micro. They're about, I've got um, pictures of them on my, um, on my camera light housing because it's plastic. So the oil will stick to it and these little droplets. And you're talking about a millimeter, one millimeter or the head of a, uh, of a thumb, you know, a pin, you know, a little uh, stick pin, a little bit larger than the head of a pin. Or maybe the head of a medium ballpoint pin. That's a better way to describe it. That's the size of the droplets of oil. And so all of the marine snow just picks it up like a sponge. And then whatever eats the marine snow, it's like a hydrocarbon pill it just took. And when I say hydrocarbons, we're talking about toluene, styrene, xylene, um, benzene. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're not safe compounds by any means. Uh, to you, Jimmy. Okay, sure. So, um, now you were talking also about the sampling, and they were giving you like a, a load of grief about uh, what they call targeted sampling. Right? So I was just having a little thought there, like over the years in the Gulf, I, I'd imagine that it was a, a, a pretty. I'd imagine that there was a lot of testing of the waters in the Gulf over the years. So there would already probably exist a, a good baseline record of how the Gulf should be um, at various different locations around. Just an idea that I had. Like, so what was the, you know, um, basically like, you know, you were saying like there was 4,300 various plants and uh, rigs based uh, dotted around the Gulf. So um, it would seem to me that no matter where you go in the Gulf, that you, you, you were probably going to be picking up readings of hydrocarbons and uh, and waste products from all over the place, really. Like, So um, do you want to go into that a little bit more? Or? Sure. Let me, let me try to remember um, where, where you started with. With the targeted, uh, they were complaining about the targeted, um, there were complaints about the, the way you were targeting sites for uh, taking Sample. readings, yeah, and samples, yeah. Would there not exist yeah, yeah, already a, a good baseline from all over the Gulf, really, to, of like how the Gulf should have been 
from previous sure. years. And you know, um, yeah, where I'd like to, to start with that is um, there should have been a better, I mean, there should have been a fantastic baseline that, that you're talking about. There should have been. Uh, the government oversight dropped the ball. LSU and Mineral Management Service together are responsible for allowing the oil companies not to do what they were supposed to do. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, before the oil spill, all of us did targeting sampling. We didn't just do what you would call random sampling. If if you see a slick, you would go out there and you would sample that slick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. It's not, not like if you saw a slick, well, then I'm just going to take a bunch of samples everywhere to see where it is. No, you went and saw it wherever you saw it and you sampled it. Well, you know, the, the governments have had, you know, requirements that um, LSU and some of these other entities did not hold them to. And why do I keep saying LSU? And that's because LSU um, uh, works in conjunction with the oil companies to produce what's called NEPA documents. A NEPA, a NEPA document is um, an analysis that uh, it's an environmental analysis of what good or bad effects that these platforms have on the environment. So they're supposed to go in and if it's a good effect, they're supposed to document. If it's a negative effect, they're supposed to document in these reports. And these are supposed to come out every five years. There's supposed to be a NEPA analysis on every on the platforms. And so um, a guy named Jim Cowan and another fella, um, I'm trying to think of his name at LSU, they have, because they're consultants for the oil companies, which I also am, I, I must admit, but I don't run interference for the oil companies like these guys do. These guys have basically just will not, will not um, analyze p platforms as any source of uh, biological activity. In other words, the fish that are around it, they don't count in their, um, in their counting for the fish in the Gulf of Mexico. And so all the organisms that are on the platform are, they're, they're just blind to them. They refuse to acknowledge the, uh, amount of life that lives on the structure. And part of this is because if the oil companies have to address how many corals they're killing when they remove that platform. So what they say is, well, those, those reefs aren't permanent. So we ignore them and we don't count the fish around them either. They don't count in our, in our harvestable fish. But if you go fishing in the Gulf of Mexico for reef fish, where do you go? You go to the platforms. And that's where you catch most of your offshore fish except for tuna. You know, any of the are the open ranging fish. But any of the other fish, you go to the rig if you want to catch snapper. And so LSU has been instrumental in helping the oil companies to avoid any um, any assessment of these reefs. And so, uh, that is uh, obviously Louisiana State University. Obviously. Yes, yes, that's right. And so... Um, and so it, it's it's just like this, you know. There, it's the, uh, you know, research dollars go in and nothing comes out. And so they are they are part of the problem um, that we're having down here with not being able to get information associated with an industry that you know has been running roughshod over us for. I mean, it's just been—it's ridiculous. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, it's, well, okay I mean, it's a very common problem, unfortunately, and it's—we're uh, seeing it all over the world. I mean, we've—I uh, think with uh, Maureen, we managed to uh, uh, tie up a similar uh, situation in Ireland, uh, in County Mayo, with Shell Oil. Uh, we've talked about Fukushima, Tepco in Japan. Um, and uh, I'm sure we could carry on and on and on. You know, we could hit Africa and talk about Nigeria and lots of other things. So, but, but I believe, uh, Sean, though, wasn't it Maureen that um, brought up the point last week about the coral and how the, the coral reefs actually act like sponges and absorb uh, a lot of the, the, the chemicals and the pollutants right inside them? Um, it seems to yeah. me, Scott, that like the best place to, to test for the hydrocarbons will be in a, in a sample of coral. And that's exactly what, what Scott's been doing. So. Let, and, and so that's what we did. You know, I mean, yeah. we waited and we waited for them to fund us. And so finally we gathered our resources together. It wasn't much, but we were able to collect coral at different depths and collect um, bryozoans or collect sponges and to see which ones were holding the most. And the corals, of course, they captured and held the most um, – uh, hydrocarbons and I found concentrations over 1,000 parts per million. So you're talking about parts per thousand there. 
you know, like yeah. you measure salt in parts per thousand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, and we did find other, you know, it wasn't just in one sample. There's one sample over a thousand parts per million. There was another sample over 800 parts per million, another sample over 400 parts per million. But the, zo the bryozoans and the sponges also were having two and three and 400 parts per million hydrocarbons, you know, total petroleum hydrocarbons in their uh, bodies also that we were able to collect and show that at different depths, as you would think that at the surface there would be more than at the depth of 60 or 80 foot. And that's not what the samples indicated. The samples indicated that the ones at the deeper depth had a higher concentration. And to me, this makes sense because of something called the partitioning principle. The partitioning principle says that um, oxidation is going to happen much quicker at the surface of the water and in the air than it will in the water. And likewise, oxidation is going to happen much quicker in the water than it will in a sediment or in reef material. In other words, it's going to stay around a lot longer in the reef material than it ever will in the water. So it's harder to get out, in other words. And I've got samples two years old that I've held underwater that still look like it's pushing out hydrocarbons from the skeletons. About, uh, about yourself, Scott, scary. I've got one more point here I'd like to bring up because I know your time is uh, precious just at the minute. But about your health, Scott, now, because I know that you, you became quite ill from, from one of the dives. What sort of symptoms have you been uh, showing? Well, I just went diving on an oyster reef in uh, Breton Sound, I guess it was about three weeks ago, three or four weeks now. And... Um, and we pulled the dredge around, found a, there was a slick that came out of the sediments. And I'm taking oyster samples out of those same sediments. And so I noticed um, afterwards that I did have a little bit of muscle cramps on the way home and started to get a headache that I um, uh, come to recognize as, you know, uh, a, an exposure headache. In other words, it's, it's in the top of my head. It feels like the top of my head is going to split. It's not like a migraine behind my eyes. It's really a different place in my head. And then so for the next three days following the diving, I had what felt like a chemical pneumonia again, a mild case this time of chemical pneumonia. In other words, I felt a little bit of a burning in my chest. Why? I'm not sure. I didn't really smell PAHs that would do it. So I think that that is a weak, that's what's been weakened on me. And of course, whatever gets weakened on you is one of the first places that you feel it. And, um, and so my chest and my throat was hurting and, um, my skin broke out in uh, the itching red bumps again, the rash, you know, appeared all, you know, virtually all over my body again. And um, that's something that's persistent, that ever, whenever I come in contact with it, uh, I get a rash. Um, by the way, when I ask, you know, different doctors, I, I talk to different ones, uh, my family doctor says that he's seen something like that before. When people get, um, they've been taking their medications for so long that they build up an allergic reaction to it, he sees the same type thing happen to people that have been taking a medication for too long. So it's, it's type, it's a, um, basically your, your cup is filled. Could it be the body? Could it be the body also trying to push uh, toxins out? Well, I, I believe that's exactly what it is because um, it really starts to become inflamed as I sweat. But I notice that the more I sweat and the more I stay out of the water and I'm able to sweat and teach, you know, or go to my martial arts classes and teach and do what, what I got to do to, to, to get the sweat going, that that actually, it does stay erupted for a little while, but it, it eventually will help. The more I sweat, it does help push it out. It seems like so um, it, it'll leave a little white scar afterwards, but the red bump and the itchiness part of it has gone. So, um, yes, maybe it is trying the body trying to push out whatever, you know, is, um, contaminants that it can get out. And of course, uh, we've got uh, Trisha Springstead and I think one or two others that are going to be talking about the health effects uh, of uh, people in the uh, Gulf area um, yeah. coming up in the near future. Yeah, and you know, I, I didn't, I didn't bring up the um, internal, the bowel issues that we potentially had with it. I know that um, I have, you know, stomach issues after diving, and and you can't help but drink, take the water in when you're out there. I mean, it's just when you're diving, it just gets in. And so I do have stomach issues afterwards, another you know, cramping, um, loose stool. I mean, I hate to be, you know, that um, dramatic, but I mean, or that descriptive. But um, cramps, 
um, you know, cramp, muscle cramps, but cramps in my chest and in my stomach and uh, just queasy, don't want to eat, um, a little dizzy, you know, like type feeling, just, to, just like it's a cold again. And so um, just to give you an idea of what, of, of what the government says about this kind of stuff, on the NERDA website, I looked and they had two studies that they, were, that they were touting. There was only two studies on the website. One was about the dolphins and how hydrocarbons affect the dolphins and giving them chemical pneumonia-like um, uh, um, symptoms in their chest and in their lungs and the problems that they've had in the dolphin uh, community around Fouchon and Grand Isle. They should be the most healthiest dolphins in the country because they contain less of the um, heavy metals and PCBs from industrial and agricultural runoff. We just don't have, because we have so much um, fresh water put into our system and so much sediment that a lot of that gets taken out of the water column and locked up. So our dolphins should have been healthy because they had the least amount in the, the, of these uh, things in the country. And yet they had the, hard, the highest death rate and the highest pneumonia rate. And they think it's because of dispersed oil. Wow. Uh, well, also, can, can I go one more thing? Yeah. Um, the other study that they were touting was what they learned from Exxon Valdez in that how the um, hydrocarbons affect uh, the vertebrate heart and more specifically it how it affects the tuna heart and um, hydrocarbon contamination affects tuna hearts by reducing its efficiency by 30 percent or more which means that that heart has to beat a third more times just to get the same amount of uh, blood flow as they were getting before which means they can't keep it up you know they're not as strong as they were and so um, what's interesting about that, well, and it does shorten the lifespan of the tuna and, and, and several other effects that they found. But what's interesting about that is the, the same, oh, it affects the ionic pathways. The hydrocarbons affect the ionic pathways of the muscle in the heart and causes a heart arrhythmia, arrhythmic heartbeat. Okay. And so um, what's interesting about that is the vertebrate heart in the tuna works the same as it does in humans. It's the same chemical pathways that makes our heart beat that makes their heart beat. Right. So um, folks that are having heart problems now, and quite a few folks that, that I've been hearing, you know, talking to down here and interviewing that um, they're going to the doctor because they have heart problems. And I brought that up. I said, well, really? I said, well, did you look and notice that the tuna has a uh, heart, uh, heart uh, issues due to its ionic pathways? It's the potassium ionic pathways, I believe. Um, is what uh, the hydrocarbons affect, and um, and none of them heard it. Nor did the doctors down here even know it. Although NERDA has this paper on its website, it's not promoting it. It's not telling people. Sure, sure. Uh, we're seeing that a lot with. Um, I mean, we, Ian Fairley did one on uh, did a, a study on uh, nuclear power stations. It was uh, uh, thoroughly rinsed out within the peer review process. It took him two years to get it up. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's like bulletproof, but you never hear about it, you know, it's just like, it's like, might as well not be there, you know. Um, it did, it was downloaded by many uh, health physicists, but um, they're not really talking about it. So, once again, a very common sort of uh, situation you find there. Um, look, Scott, look, thank you so much uh, for this interview. And uh, we'd like to get you back, because I, I know there's... Uh, There'll be the updates on the um, sort of uh, the oil spill, the ongoing oil spill that you were on about. That uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to see some of the evidence uh, concerning that, and uh, maybe we could get you back for a, a chat about that. Um, and also, I'd like to get you maybe back for a chat about various other aspects of what you're doing in the Gulf, because I know that uh, I want to sort of explore a bit more your coral. Um, sort of farming uh, that you're doing, uh, if that's the right term to use, as well as your uh, sort of uh, activist studying uh, stuff and your, your employed stuff. But uh, um, we, uh, apparently, I, I just thought I'd bring in that uh, uh, the actual corals, uh, they make um, some sort of uh, medication or something. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they, um, Tabastria, the species that we're harvesting and that, that occurs here in the largest volume of anywhere else in the world because of the unique place that, that we have for it to grow. They have, uh, Tabastria has a compound called Tabastrine that has uh, natural um, anti-cancerous properties and another compound inside of it called Astrazine that has antiviral properties. So, wow. 
And uh, so, so this is kind of a, a new uh, sort of uh, finding, is it, or are these are uh, these things that have been around for some time? Or? Um, I I think they've known about the tabastrine and the astrazine for several several years, but nobody's had it in a large enough um, supply to harvest really to be able to you know collect a a, a, a huge volume of it like we can. And uh, I, th I think the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, obviously, as well as that, and, and I want to really sort of cover, will be the uh, your impression on the, uh, because as you were saying, that you've got these whole new coral, uh, and they, they start from, they've got the whole uh, sort of uh, ev evolution of the coral uh, process, um, including, you know, and, and they're ongoing. And they're in different, uh, I presume that in different places, they are in different stages of evolution. Um, uh, and uh, you know, would you like to come back one day? And maybe, maybe we'd go into some of the the nature side of things. You know, maybe away from the doom and gloomy bits. So, would, would that be okay? Oh, that would be wonderful. You know, that's our that's our main <laughs> the main topic we love to talk about is the Alice in Wonderland type reefs that are there, and the studies that we can do, and the sharks. And I mean, it's just a really an amazing, amazing ecosystem. And I I hope that hope that it's resilient and it can bounce back i mean uh, well i think uh, the work that you and uh, your colleagues are doing and uh, obviously the other activists are doing around there and uh, many other people around the world as well uh, maybe we'll get the word out maybe we'll uh, we'll, we'll start banging heads and um, uh, figuratively speaking and uh, and start uh, getting some processes going to sort of uh, uh, being a bit more uh, friendly to our planet and to our, uh, our local communities that live uh, live by these industrial areas um, so uh, have you got anything to say Jimmy just before we finish off well, I'd just like to thank Scott very, very much for coming on. That was uh, extremely interesting. Uh, it's, it's fascinating being able to be part of documenting what's going on in the Gulf now since the, since the spill. It's uh, uh, So uh, I look forward to having you back on the show again at some stage, Scott, and you take care of yourself, my friend. And I suppose I should say just very briefly that uh, on the uh, article, at newsweekly.wordpress.com. Uh, we'll put links to uh, um, Scott's uh, websites and uh, Facebooks and uh, any other links that are relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, so obviously check that out and we'll have all the links up there. And we'll certainly be linking to Charles Williams Diggs, who as a journalist has, uh, has written articles. Uh, so we have a lot of articles that are written with testimony that he's collected. Um, uh, some really good summarized stuff. Uh, document all these uh, activists and scientists and professionals who have been uh, working uh, to uh, sort of protect uh, their environments uh, and and the people in those environments. Um, so we're going to continue to do that uh, so that people we, we have a an online um, sort of uh, database uh, that people can access if they wish to get quotes or whatever, especially journalists and what have you. So um, okay, well with that, uh, thanks a lot, Scott. And we'll we'll, we'll uh, we're going to catch you again, God willing. It's such a good interview. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I don't know if you mind me plugging the YouTube site. Go for it. Please do. I'd like, uh, really would like your opinion on the videos at Scott Porter, marine biologist. It's at YouTube. Okay. And it might, might point out that RT pinched one of your videos and didn't give you any, uh, uh, confirm uh, any sort of recognition. But I did put a comment underneath in the YouTube and on RT where they pinched your video. And uh, I told them they should accredit you. So <laughs> that, that was my Thank bit very much. I did a bit of trolling for you there. I hope you appreciate <laughs> Thank it. You. Thank you all very much. God bless. God bless.